Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Northwest University, we'd like to welcome you to our postgraduate open day for the Faculty of Law. We have a jam-packed two hours planned for you. Incredible experts speaking on all the different uh, offerings that we have when it comes to postgraduate studies in law. They are here to answer your questions. So as you watch this, uh, if you have any questions whatsoever on anything that the experts are talking about, or even more administrative uh, questions, you're more than welcome to pose it. Uh, we'll try to answer them, and uh, if we do not answer them live, we'll most probably answer them by coming back to you if you include your, your email address. But welcome. It's nice to have all of you here, uh, and I hope you find the following two hours both informative and entertaining. At the end of this webinar, we'll have five lucky draws for those of you who are participating in this uh, webinar. So the, uh, I, I won't give away the contents of the, the lucky draws for now. You'll have to wait for it a little bit. So right at the end, uh, stay tuned uh, so that uh, we can see perhaps uh, you are the lucky winner of one of our five lucky prizes. So let's uh, kick things off. We'll start with the director for the postgraduate program, uh, the very esteemed Professor Avitus Agbor. Uh, he is uh, quite the expert. You'll see him a little bit later on. But first off, in his capacity as the director of the postgraduate program, to talk a little bit about the LLM research, the LLD thesis, as well as our PhD in law. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Avitus Akbor. Thank you so much. Good morning to everyone, and thank you for joining us on this day. Um, you all know that across the country, as well as the globe, <clears throat> the demand for postgraduate qualifications is increasing. And I think the statistics we have indicate to that. In 2018, we received about 150 applications on the Mafican campus already. In 2019, that number increased by almost 100%. And in 20, for 2020, we received over 800 applications. This is because of the fact that our programs are contextually relevant, not only in South Africa, for across the globe as well. Secondly, we have great experts in different areas of law, which actually make it easier for students to get study guidance while they are studying. And thirdly, we have sufficient support in place to assist students who come for postgraduate programs. Um, we have about five different parts in the Faculty of Law for postgraduate programs. The first one is a postgraduate diploma in labor law. The second will be structured masters or what you call the LLM by coursework. Then you also have the LLM by research. You have the doctor of laws or the LLD and you have the PhD in law and development. I'll be speaking about the admission criteria. Um, to be admitted for the master's program, you must have scored at least 60% average on all your final year models. For the master's by research, you must also have scored 60% as well as 65% on your mini dissertation at the final year model. For the LRD, we need at least 65% on your master's degree. For the PhD, we need 65% on any master's degree. For those applying for the LRD by research, you'll also need to identify a potential supervisor. This means you'll have to browse the faculty website, identify which research area actually comes into your, your research, the research, the research you intend to pursue, and then you contact that particular colleague of mine, and then you will establish an agreement whether he or she will be willing to assist you with supervision. If that is not possible, you can write to me directly. You'll find my email address on the website. Alternatively, you can develop a concept note that outlines the technical aspects of your research, and then send to me, and then I'll assess the application in its entirety. Then the faculty also provides buses for postgraduate students. The body is supposed to assist students, and we also we always determine from time to time how much we have to allocate to students. The body amounts for master students by coursework, masters by research, and the doctorate is always different from time to time. But it all depends on the budget we receive from the university. There is also the NWU bursary, which assists students with registration and tuition fees. But that one you have to apply through the NWU bursary office of the institution. Um, the program leaders will come here to talk about the different structural masters. But let me just highlight a few things about the LRD. The Doctor of Laws, you require a master's degree before you can apply, because it's actually 
specifically law. But for the PhD in law and development, you don't require a master's in law, you require any master's degree because it focuses on different aspects as long as it touches on law and development. So that is it from my side, and I don't know if there are any further questions. From... Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Agbo, uh, for that introduction and a, a brief overview. Ladies and gentlemen, you would have heard that the uh, professor uh, refers to the website. So you're more than welcome to also visit our website. In the Faculty of Law, uh, we have quite a, a, an extensive description of all the different uh, qualifications on offer as well as more information also on the bursaries uh, that the professor alluded to. Thank you, Professor. We'll see a little bit more of you a little bit later on. Uh, we are now going to switch to cities, law and environmental sustainability. And uh, we are going to welcome Professor Amnel Duplessis. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, Professor Arnel Duplessis. She holds the Saatchi Kles Chair. Uh, so she is actually quite busy with the research aspects, more specifically so focused on cities, law and environmental sustainability. Ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to welcome Professor Arnel Duplessis. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As you've heard, my name is Arnal de Blissy, the chairholder of the South African Research Chair in Cities, Law and Environmental Sustainability, CLES for short. This NRF Sarchi Chair is based at the Faculty of Law of the Northwest University in the so-called secondary city of Bachev Struan. The chair is co-funded by the NRF, the National Research Foundation of South Africa, and NetBank and currently comprises of myself as the chairholder, as well as 14 full-time postgraduate students, that is masters and doctoral students, as well as a couple of postdoctoral fellows. These students all study with bursaries from the National Research Foundation. The focus of the legal research that we do at the chair is on urban development and the pressures of urbanization on the natural environment. Now, this topic is highly relevant given the fast rate of urbanization, not only in South Africa, but also on the African continent, as well as the growing prominence of environmental disasters, such as droughts, floods, fires, and severe loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services within urban environments. As you will be able to tell from our website and social media platforms, the research agenda of CLES comprises of three focus areas. The postgraduate students who join the chair all link the individual research projects, that is their dissertations, theses, and so on, with one of these focus areas. Some of the postgraduate student projects that are running at the moment are extremely exciting um, and features interesting topics such as water insecurity in South Africa and its relevance from a climate change law perspective. The procedural and substantive environmental rights of children living in African cities, the South African investment law framework and the way in which it stimulates investment in green urban transport infrastructure, the street trading sector and informality in South African cities with a focus on the waste picking sector, the legal protection of ecosystem services in urban areas, the hampering role of corruption in the quest for sustainability, the legally relevant meaning of so-called public value for developmental local government, the potential of technology for the improved realization of the constitutional right of access to water in South Africa, alternative energy for the alleviation of energy poverty, and spatial planning law as a tool for the response to climate change in our country. So in addition to these rather interesting student projects, we have a number of projects running with institutional partners, such as the United Nations Habitat Division, um, the South African Cities Network, the South African Local Government Association, as well as the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. South Africa literally has only a handful of legal scholars working on urban development. While we have a few universities presenting courses on local government law specifically, 
The broader concept of urban law has not yet made it as a focal point into any undergrad or postgraduate curriculum at any university in the country. So moving forward and helping to build intelligence on cities in our country, a key objective of our chair is to remain, it remains to train, inspire, and to retain emerging legal scholars who are passionate about improving the city as a space where we live, work, and play, as well as a governor, not only in South Africa, but also um, on the African continent. So if you are interested in learning more um, about the work that we do at PLACE, or if you consider to conduct the LLM or doctoral study as part of a vibrant team of legal scholars, please contact the chair via any of our social media platforms or our website or email. And please note that we also publish a quarterly newsletter that is available for download from our website. While we are already at full capacity for 2021, we invite applications for the 2022 academic year. Professor, uh, I'm fascinated by the scope of the work that you do. I mean, you've, you've mentioned relevance uh, quite a, uh, a few times. Um, so I'm fascinated by that, and I'm astounded by the idea that urban law, uh, as you said, uh, we, we do not as yet see feature uh, on an undergraduate or on a postgraduate level to the extent that we would like to have it uh, there. Uh, and we hear so many things of municipalities and local government and so on that would make this even more relevant. So if you can, uh, expand a little bit on the relevance um, uh, of the degree. I, I feel that at, at, during the times that we live in in South Africa, it is extremely relevant. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think that um, the existence, mere existence of this chair is testimony to the fact that research in the area of urban law is extremely relevant. In the South African context, it's relevant ties directly with urbanization. We see more and more people flocking um, to our cities. And I should also add that cities in this context is not only referring to our metropolitan areas such as Johannesburg, Tswane, Durban, Cape Town, Port Elizabeth or um, Buffalo City, East London. We are also talking about emerging secondary cities. Pochistrum is typically one, Mafeking is typically one, Rustenburg is typically one of those, Nelspray. These areas are fast expanding and the, the relevance from an environmental law perspective, which is the analytical lens that we arrive at looking at urban development, is that urbanization impact on the natural environment. And while it is true that, that we should accommodate people in our cities and creating jobs and other opportunities, our natural resources are finite. Um, water specifically, there's a lot of pressure on, on our water systems, the quality of our air, and also soil. Um, often we find that, that cities expand into agricultural areas, um, putting some pressure on, on food security as well. So I, I would like to believe that it is incredibly relevant. It's an area of public as well as private law. And we are going to see it um, rising and developing much faster in, in the next decade or so. Professor, and some of the other questions you typically get asked by students, uh, I mean, how long do you have to study? You've been studying, it, it feels like most probably all your life. <laughs> Um, Kibbe, thank you. Um, I see that we also received a few questions that link up with those that I usually receive. Um, first of all, one of the questions that I get is, do I need to be a, a legal or a law student to be able to join the class chair? The answer is that you should have a passion for law and should have at least have some prior training in, in legal studies, um, be it a BA law or a BCom law, for a master's um, a qualification, you would need a four-year LLB degree. For a doctoral study, you would need to have a master's degree. But we are all for multidisciplinary research. We are not black letter lawyers. We look at the law from a um, spirit of the law perspective, and we invite people that are curious about solving legal problems using empirical research methods um, that, that also look into problem-solving um, information and, and research results 
from other areas such as geography, um, urban studies, political studies, philosophy even, and of course, environmental management. Incredible. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, any other questions that you see there on your side? Um, so how long do you have to study at least and how long can you stay at what my students say is their academic home? For a master's study, you typically have two years maximum and for a doctoral study, a total of three years. That's also how long the, the funding of the NRF um, goes for. And um, as far as the academic requirements cons are concerned, I should add that we only take in some of the best performers. So those marks for the undergrad qualification is quite important. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is truly a prestigious uh, chair to be involved in. And uh, uh, when, when, you, uh, when you think and contemplate on the different options available to you, give some serious uh, consideration to the work that the chair is doing here. Um, not only, as you've heard, do we speak of relevance, but it's also a contemporary issue in postgraduate law. And uh, I can vouch for the work that uh, Professor Duplessis and the team uh, uh, that they are doing. It's truly uh, remarkable. Uh, Professor Duplessis, thank you so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any other questions, uh, please pose them. The professor will be here for a while and uh, we'll see if we can uh, uh, pull some questions through to her side as well. Ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to move on to the postgraduate diploma in labor law, and we're going to talk to Dr. Andri Wertes. Right, ladies and gentlemen, just the other day, I've had a, a, a query from a prospective student on the postgraduate diploma in labor law. It is a, a very popular uh, qualification, and uh, we get at the Northwest University quite a number of applicants within this specifically uh, this specific uh, postgraduate qualification. Uh, here to uh, talk a little bit more about what it entails and why you should register for this qualification is Dr. Andri Boetes. Good morning. Thank you very much, Gheerpia. Uh, my name is Dr. Andri Boetes, and I am the program coordinator of the postgraduate diploma in labor law. <laughs> This is an NQF Level 8 qualification, and it is presented in collaboration with and accredited by the Commission for Conciliation, Mediation and Arbitration. This program is primarily aimed at deepening your knowledge and understanding of the labor law and the world of work. But, but especially, we also attempt to develop your dispute resolution skills. So with this, we are bridging the gap between academia and the practice. Um, with this program, in collaboration with the CCMA, we are aimed to train the commissioners of the future. So if you successfully complete this diploma, you will be able to step into the CCMA and apply to become a commissioner. So for this reason, you will be working very closely with senior commissioners of the CCMA who will assist us in training um, you in terms of, of practical skills. So if we have a look at the slides, what does the program look like? We have this as a one-year program divided into two semesters. And there will be four modules in total during the course of the year. We will cover two modules in the first semester and two modules in the second semester. So just to give you a quick overview, module one will have regard to the constitution and other labor law sources. So we will have a look at what the role of the constitution in the labor law and the world of work is and how it uh, assisted in developing the labor law as we have it today. And we will also have a look at other types of labor law sources um, and their roles and how they are applied in the labor law. Then the second module that we have is individual labor law. In this module, we will only consider the individual employment relationship, who is an employee, who is an employer. We will consider matters such as basic conditions of employment, dismissal, discrimination, etc. Then in the second semester, we will have collective labor law, which will focus on collective bargaining, collective agreements, 
trade unions, strike action, etc. And then the fourth module, very importantly, is the practical module. Here we will do dispute resolution, practice and procedure. And it is here where the senior commissioners will become involved in your practical training in dispute resolution. You will also, as a part of this particular module, be expected to do observations of real conciliations and arbitrations at the CCMA offices we select for you. But don't worry, we will coordinate this process along with the help of a facilitator appointed by the CCMA specifically for this purpose. Quickly about the assessment plan for this module or for this program rather, we will have two assignments for each module, both mod uh, assignments which you have to pass to gain access to the examination. And then you will have successfully completed a module after you have passed the examination with a minimum of 50%. I also want to quickly tell you something about our delivery method, which is quite unique um, in terms of comparison with the other postgraduate programs. This diploma is registered as both a distance and a contact program. Now, how does that work? It means that many of the seminars, as they are presented throughout the year, will you be able to stream live from your home? You do not necessarily need to be on campus, on Port of Sturm campus, to attend the seminar. You can sit at home if you have stable internet, if you have enough internet data, and you can stream the seminar as it goes along. But then in terms of the practical module in the second semester, your in-person attendance will be required for these training sessions with the CCMA Commissioner. We will make use of a specialized program that you will install on your computer. We will provide you with all the details. You can install the program on your computer so as to be able to stream the seminars as they are conducted. Any questions from the audience? Uh, Dr. Burtis, we, we do have a, a question here. Uh, that actually speaks to what you've last mentioned now, the mode of delivery yes. uh, when it comes to the practical and the contact, mm -hmm. uh, contact uh, with especially the CCMA senior commissioners, yes. I think. Yeah. How does that uh, work? Is it, uh, do they come in person and present? Is there a one-on-one -on -one session? Mm -hmm. That is a very interesting question because we actually had a lot of challenges with this particular aspect during the COVID uh, lockdown. Uh, usually what we do is students will all gather on Porch of Sturm campus and the senior commissioner will come over to Porch campus and the sessions will usually take place in two parts depending on the, on the amount of work that needs to be covered. Let's take, for instance, the, the study unit regarding conciliation of this dispute resolution module. The conciliation part will start with a theoretical exposition of the steps of the conciliation, how it will take place. But then during the second session, which would likely take place on a second day, will take it will take the form of role plays with the commissioner and they will take you step by step they will break you up in groups and they will take you step by step through the process and at some point you will act as the commissioner other times you will act as one of the parties and in this way they will develop your skills in how to how to run these particular processes sounds incredible it's very practical and it very is. skills oriented and it, 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 once on completion of the diploma you immediately walk in and be able to do the work it's, technically it's really technically that would be possible but uh, the candidates should also keep in mind that we are doing the academic portion of this of this um this ability to become a commissioner but when you then step into the the ccma and want to apply to be a commissioner you do have a six-month mentor process that you will have have to run through where you will kind of shadow a senior commissioner and at some point you will start conducting the conciliations and arbitrations yourself but with the assistance of the senior commissioner by your side so there will be a, a, a practical component as well you will not necessarily immediately qualify as a commissioner on qualification and admittance we have another question here uh, on completion of the postgraduate diploma in uh, labor law on NQF 8, 
uh, will they then be allowed to enter into the masters uh, in labor law? We have received a lot of these types of queries, but unfortunately, in terms of the LLM requirements, you will have to have had an LLB degree or another four-year law degree of similar standing. So unfortunately, the postgraduate diploma in itself will not grant you access to the LLM programs. But the diploma then focuses on this role in conflict resolution in, in labor law yes. and uh, once you're in, yeah, yeah. Uh, you'll be doing that. Dr. Buertas, uh, Buertas thank you so much uh, for uh, coming in and talking to us about this. Uh, again, a uh, very popular uh, postgraduate quali qualification in the Northwest University's Faculty of Law. We appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll uh, give Professor Agbor the opportunity to come and talk to us uh, directly after this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not too sure, but I think Professor Agbor had a coffee whilst uh, we gave him time off and uh, now he's back. He's had his coffee and he's ready to talk to us uh, about public law and legal philosophy. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Avitus Agbor. Thank you so much. Good morning once again. Um, Avitus Agbor, the, the program leader for public law and legal philosophy. Often we have conversations about things like corruption, xenophobia, hate crimes, migration, crimes in the country, and gender-based violence. And um, we ask ourselves, what is it that needs to be done in order to resolve some of these um, tough issues in the country? The Public Law and Legal Philosophy Program actually aims at stimulating critical thinking. It actually questions things the way they are and comes, uh, offers students the opportunity to come up with bold imaginations on how we can actually resolve them. Public law and legal philosophy becomes that space, the opportunity for us to question the exercise of public power. And the way we design the program, we make sure that students can actually think independently and critically and be able to ask tough questions on how we can regulate public power and also resolve some of those critical issues that affect our society. So in the first semester, the two models that are offered are constitutional and human rights law, which looks at human rights within the South African context as well as on the international plane. Then the second model is jurisprudential approaches in Southern Africa, which is more into philosophy about uh, uh, in the Southern African region. In the second semester, there is public international law that focuses on the principles and the rules that govern states and non-state actors on the international plane. There's also administrative law, which actually is reviewing the exercise of discretion by public officials. There's also a mini dissertation component, which is um, with 100 credits. It's an opportunity for the student to actually conduct research on a particular area. Um, the LLM in public and legal philosophy is typically done in a year, but you could actually do it in two years. And um, the mode of delivery is contact. But given the way we do things now at NWU, it's possible for a student to be resident in Portestrom, in Val, or Mafeking, and then take the programs because we're going to use uh, technology to deliver the seminars. And most seminars are organized in a block format. So to say a lecturer identifies like a particular week and then delivers the seminars and then assesses the students. I think that should be it for public law. And if there are any questions, I think I can answer them. Uh, Professor, the, the first one I think is very professorial in, in nature and it refers to the, the nature of philosophy. Now you've alluded to uh, that you, you enhance the competence of the student in critical thinking. Um, I'm interested in the link between an understanding of philosophy and critical thinking. What, what is the, the relationship between the two? The whole, the whole essence of public and legal philosophy is to make sure people can think independently and critically. That's just the whole thing. And I think with, with conversations about decolonization, Africanization, indigenization, everyone should be able to become a philosopher and make contribution to legal scholarship. Mm. And, and we see this, I think, in, in the critical thinking, often in, uh, in postmodernism, uh, post-structuralism, and as you've alluded in post-colonialism, asking serious questions 
uh, about what happens and happened in South Africa and in, in Africa. And that actually brings me to our next aspect. You've mentioned that in, in the beginning of the program, there is a focus both uh, national uh, and international. Can you expand a little bit on, uh, on, on that a little bit more? Our goal is to make sure that we don't just download lots of principles and theories on our students. We have to make sure that the education they get is contextually relevant and giving them the opportunity to broaden their knowledge in what happens across the globe. So if we are talking about public international or human rights, for example, what are the contextual challenges that we face on the African continent, on the African society? What are those unique challenges that people face at different levels? And what is it that we can develop, we can devise to make sure that we can actually embrace human rights standards without compromising cultural aspects of the people out of the And I think that is just what is shaping the discourse now on decolonization, on Africanization. Is it that we must accept everything Western that is brought to Africa or can we think as Africans and see how we can give that African flair, that African touch, that flavor on things that are African and then without compromising standards. So if we talk about human rights, let's not be, we say because Africa, there can be gender equality. No, we should accept concepts of gender equality, those values that shape the way we do things. Mm. Yeah. I'm, I'm often astounded by the uh, the 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 wealth of diversity that we have uh, on the on the continent. Uh, as an African, uh, we are uh, I myself. We we're, we're constantly driven towards critical questions about your own identity. I was I was wondering how 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 do we see this from a human rights perspective? Like would 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 there be uh, there be different focal areas once we look at sub-Saharan Afri Africa? Uh, do we have other issues in Western Africa or Northern Africa? Uh, uh, do you make this distinction in this qualification? Oh, like I said, we, we stimulate students' ability to think independently and critically. And in the, in the context of the question you've asked, if you look at diversity, diversity in terms of political opinions, social orientation, economic means in terms of gender, in terms of religious beliefs, etc., that should be the beauty which becomes the wealth of Africa. Africa is a very diverse continent. And until we explore the diversity for our own development, it's not going to work. If you look at conflicts in Africa, human rights abuses, it's actually based on the fact that certain individuals have not embraced diversity. I can't, I'm not receptive, receptive of political dissidents. I'm not receptive of those who have different sexual orientations, religious beliefs, etc. So if we can't harness our energies and our thinking system to ensure that we embrace diversity and make it more of more of some, something which we can actually explore for our own development, it becomes a challenge. Yeah. Uh, Professor, I think uh, our last question for you is a bit less esoteric, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's a bit more on the practicalities when it comes to the mode of, of delivery. It speaks on, on the, the nature of the seminars. Now, uh, you've mentioned that uh, uh, locality is not an issue. You can log on and view the seminar and so on. But you've also said there's an assessment involved in the seminar. Tell us a little bit more about the seminars within uh, this qualification. Seminars are done in a block mode. Like I said, you can just, the lecturer chooses about five days in a week and delivers them. Um, Every student who is registered in any of our programs must be on the eFundly platform. And that is the platform that is used to administer assignments, to submit work, etc. Now, um, no student is required. It's a, it's a mavicam based program, but it doesn't mean that if you're in Portestrom, you can't take the program, or you must travel to Mavicam for the seminars. No. You can be in Portestrom when it's time for the seminar. You could decide for log, to log off from your house and then on your computer and access the computers and um, access the seminars. We want to make sure that um, every seminar is accessible to every student no matter where they are. We, we, we're trying to cut down on cost, trying to increase accessibility to our educational programs. So we can't strictly require that you must be in Mafeking to take the LM in public and legal philosophy. No, I think we're dealing away with that now. We're doing away with that now. Thank you. Great, right, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, you've made it easy to study within this field, uh, but it's perhaps not an easy field to study in. 
Uh, we thank you for uh, enlightening us on what it entails. Ladies and gentlemen, that was public law and legal philosophy. Uh, we thank Professor Ogbo for his presence. We'll move on to uh, Dr. Niels Killian in a moment. Right, ladies and gentlemen, just before we get to uh, Dr. Killian, we've had a question here uh, uh, still related to the postgrad diploma in uh, labor law. Uh, the question reads, would it be more bef beneficial for a student uh, to, have a completed, to have completed a dispute resolution module? Uh, but we need more clarity on this. Uh, it depends on whether it's for further studies or for career planning. If, if you would like to litigate in labor law, it makes sense to first complete a practical qualification. Uh, my recommendation is, uh, uh, if you'd like to know more, let us contact Dr. Buertis. You're more than welcome to send her an email. Uh, we can bring you in touch with her as well. All right, back, back to uh, Dr. Niels Killian. And now we're going to talk a little bit about mercantile law. Uh, good morning, everyone. The LLM mercantile program will be presented for the first time from 2021. Uh, there are also uh, currently four modules in this uh, program with a mini dissertation. Uh, before I'm going to give you a background to the four modules, uh, let me just start off with the following scenario. Is it possible for a foreign company to conclude a contract with a South African company? And the answer is quite simple, yes. If you know the requirements for a valid contract, then this will not pose any problems to you. Is it possible for a foreign company to conclude a contract with a state-owned company, a South African state-owned company? And this problem is also not very difficult because if you know the requirements for a valid contract, it will also pose no problems. The next one is a little bit more complicated. Is it possible for a foreign company to conclude a contract with the Republic of South Africa? In other words, is it possible for a foreign company to conclude a contract with a state? Now, in this regard, there are different views. And the first view is, for example, Professor Dugard, who wrote a textbook on international law, a South African perspective. And he is simply of the opinion that it's quite possible for a foreign investment company to conclude a contract with a state. Other scholars or attorneys or advocates will simply say, no, it's impossible because uh, the Vienna Convention only allows for two or more states to conclude a contract with each other. In other words, bilateral or multilateral treaties. To a certain extent, I agree with Professor Dugar because in South Africa, we have the Protection of Investments Act. And the Protection of Investments Act clearly defines who is an investor, for example, a company. And the Protection of Investments Act also stipulates to you the requirements in order to resolve a dispute between a foreign investment company and, say, for example, a state. Besides the latter, if it's possible for a foreign investment company to conclude a contract with a state, it's also very important to focus on the clauses of that treaty or contract for dispute resolution uh, procedures. Sometimes the treaty will simply say that you must approach, you must submit a complaint to the international uh, organization, dispute, uh, uh, international organization to resolve your dispute. And that can either be in America or in Africa or in Europe. And sometimes the treaty will simply say that you're not allowed to approach any remedies in domestic law in order to resolve disputes between the foreign investment company and, say, for example, a state. With that scenario in mind, the following four subjects are very important because to a certain extent, they are linked to the scenario. The first subject in the LLM Mercantile Program is corporate law and corporate governance. Now we all know what is corporate law, company law, and you're going to focus on the Companies Act 2008. And as an example, we're going to focus on board meetings, shareholder meetings, and also directed delinquencies. And then another aspect is corporate governance. Why is corporate governance so important? Well, it's regulated by the King 4 report. However, the King 4 report is simply a voluntary document. In other words, there's no mandatory requirement to implement the, pro the uh, um, provisions of the King 4 report, say, for example, to the Companies Act. However, we, see, we are seeing currently in the high courts in South Africa that more and more judges are referring to the King 4 report 
in order to understand difficult company law concepts. For example, director delinquencies. In the Corporate Governance uh, King 4 report, there's a clear definition of ethics. And in brief, ethics is simply saying what is right and what is wrong. So if you apply the definition of ethics, say, for example, to director delinquencies, you'll have a better understanding how to apply the Companies Act from a South African perspective. Second subject is financial markets and securities law. Now, financial markets, very briefly, you have a secondary market and a primary market, and uh, securities deals, for example, with shares and debentures. So a share and debentures are simply referred to as securities. So a newly listed Johannes uh, company on the JSE, for example, will issue a prospectus to investors. And an investor will read the prospectus in order to make an informed decision whether to buy shares in that particular listed company. That is referred to as the primary market. The secondary market deals with where one shareholder simply sells his shares to another shareholder. And there are also statutory requirements that you must comply with in that regard. The third subject simply deals with international trade and investment. Now, international trade and investment is an extremely interesting subject. You're going to focus on the World Trade Organization. You're going to focus on the disputes settled by the World Trade Organization. And the World Trade Organization currently, there's approximately 193 members. So in other words, to be a member of the World Trade Organization, you must be a state. The World Trade Organization will, for example, tell you what's the rights and duties for individual states. And what is so important about international trade is that a country is not really sovereign. In other words, a country cannot simply decide what it's going to do in its own economy. You cannot live in isolation. We cannot exist in isolation. We need other countries for trade purposes. The last subject is the contemporary uh, intellectual property law. Uh, intellectual property law is a very interesting subject and currently a little bit undeveloped in South Africa. You're going to focus on copyright. We all know copyright. For example, plagiarism, which is a big problem. Then you're also going to focus on trademarks and patents. Now, to illustrate to you what is a patent, a contemporary example is simply medicine. In order to register a pill or to protect the internet, intellectual property associated with a pill, it's possible to register a pat patent based on the chemical composition of a pill. So for a fixed number of years, you will have intellectual property linked to that pill, and as a manufacturer, you can produce your pills. And the moment when that patent is about to expire, it's possible to change the chemical composition of that pill once again, and to register that new formula as a patent for future um, trade in South Africa. So that's my contribution to LLM Mercantile Law. Thank you. Oh, well, Dr. Niels, that was... Uh... Uh, impressive, to say the least. Uh, we have uh, two questions here. Uh, one is, this is a brand new qualification you've mentioned. It's uh, straight off the shelf from, from the year 2021. Absolutely correct. So, um, what kind of methodologies do you expect in the mini dissertation part uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the studies? Uh, it seems to me there's a very strong focus on contractual law and an eye for detail. Are we talking content analysis, discourse analysis? Uh, what would be the methodologies you focus on? Well, the methodologies will be, for example, um, a comparative study. So, for example, between South Africa and, and other states or other nations, for example, in your mini dissertation. It will be the normal research methodology. In other words, it's a textbook, case law, legislation, analysis of the uh, particular law in question. Um, so, in that regard, uh, uh, it's not empirical uh, to some extent. Thank you. Uh, the uh, last question is perhaps in bridging the gap between what is voluntary or recommended, such as you've mentioned uh, the King Four report, and, and what is uh, statutory and can be applied within the international environment. Um, how, is, is that a contentious issue? Um, uh, I know that of late, you know, there were the many discussions on intellectual property and pro and copyright. You know, what what uh, can you stand up within the international arena and fight for with legality behind yourself? 
If I understand you correctly, you're asking what's the influence of the King 4 report on. Now, the King 4 report is a voluntary document. Um, it contains approximately seven principles, and the principles are very good uh, explained in the document. So if you are uh, struggling with a specific question in the law, say, for example, the Companies Act, and you can focus on the King 4 report, where the King 4 report will give you a lot more detail how to solve a particular problem in question. You must remember that corporate governance deals with social problems and also with environmental problems. Um, you have to have a sustainable economy. You have to keep in mind that you cannot do any harm to the environment. You must keep in mind that you cannot do any harm to your social relationships within South Africa. So that's very important, uh, the King 4 report. Uh, Dr. Killian, one last uh, question. Uh, it's about the mode of delivery for mercantile law. Um, how is the uh, degree presented when it comes to mode of delivery? Uh, the mode of delivery, there will be scheduled classes on a Friday or on a Saturday. Uh, it will be, for example, by means of Zoom. Um, there's no need for you to be present in a specific class and to listen to a specific lecturer explaining to you legal problems. Uh, you can sit in your house, for example, and you can just log in to a specific Zoom link, and there you will be able to get the whole content uh, as described to you by the lecturer. Ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, Dr. Niels Killian on mercantile law. Thank you very much, doctor. Uh, we appreciate your presence here. Next on, we'll be moving to international trade, Dr. Bram Klaassen. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to focus on international trade and we are very honoured to have Dr. Bram Klaassen here with us. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, if we talk about international trade, it's quite an, a very interesting area of the law and I think I will also start with a scenario. Um, if you look at international trade, we've got a company in South Africa uh, they want to buy products um, where the supplier of the products is in Britain. Um, company A in South Africa has got a bank guarantee from a bank in Germany that guarantees company A in South Africa can pay this money. Um, furthermore, we have uh, the company transporting the goods to South Africa that's based in the Bahamas. So ask yourself, uh, doing all that contracts. Um, then there's of course also still uh, the area of law when the goods arrive in South Africa, um, the custom and excise law. So uh, the goods must be classified and there's tariffs that must be paid. Furthermore, the transport contracts with the shipping company. Uh, if you look at the areas, uh, areas of jurisdiction uh, in the scenario that I've just mentioned, you will see there's a couple of countries involved. So if there's any legal dispute, in which country will this dispute uh, be heard? Then furthermore, there's the insu insurance law. Uh, where will you insure for this? Um, so it's uh, actually very complex legal problems that can come from this area of the law. If we look at the module itself, um, there's of course, firstly, the mini dissertation uh, in a relevant topic of, of international law. And I, I would please advise anybody, any uh, prospective students who want to study this, to also to already start thinking about what topic you want to use for your mini dissertation. Then there's, of course, international law of contracts that we do, international transport law, uh, the customs and excise law, and international instruments of payment and guarantee. If we look at the assessment for the modules, uh, international law of contracts, uh, the lecture there is Pro uh, Prof. Sikh Iceland, um, you will do two assignments throughout the semester, and the exam is a five-day takeaway uh, home exam that you have to complete. 
For international law of transport, we've got two lecturers. We've got uh, Professor Luani Stander and uh, Mrs. Michelle Skuman. There's also two assignments through the semester and the 72-hour takeaway home exam. For, for customs and excise law, we've got uh, Professor Altus Joubert, also senior advocate Joubert. And the assessment here is a multiple choice questionnaire that you have to complete. And then our oral examination with the lecturer and two other people present. For international instruments of payment and guarantees, we've got Professor Charles Yuchu. And the assessment, there is two assessments throughout the semester. And then um, sometimes you will get a sit down exam, usually four or five hours sit down exam, or it can be also a five day takeaway take away home exam. Just some admin uh, with regards to the, the studies. Um, we usually um, hold compulsory attendance for classes. It will usually also be on Fridays and Saturdays, and it's compulsory for you to attend. Unfortunately, I cannot tell you what will happen uh, next year. Uh, as you can understand, with the COVID situation, we're not certain yet. This year, currently, uh, we are working on electronic uh, Zoom sessions for the students. Um, just further with assessment, you will need 50% in each of the assignments to qualify for the exams. And then also for the exam, you will need the 50% um, mark to pass the exam. Just something further on the mini dissertation. Uh, we usually try to help people to write in the area that they want to write in. But uh, we also have only a limited amount of lecturers available in this specific area. So like I said, if you are a prospective student, please contact me early with your idea for your mini dissertation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Clarsen. It's, uh, uh, it's another fascinating field and uh, specifically so in international trade. I was wondering to what extent would the student uh, need uh, a commerce uh, background? Uh, for instance, you've, you've been talking about uh, distribution. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's studies and logistics and getting, uh, uh, you know, all the, all the uh, uh, trade happening in, in from, a, from a commerce point of view. Uh, to what extent do you need uh, prior knowledge in commerce? Um, prior knowledge would definitely help. But it's not essential. Uh, most of our students come from a law background and they don't have that much uh, background in commerce. So uh, we take that into, into consideration. Um, most lecturers in that specific topic that they are teaching will start with the basic. The first class usually is a bit longer and they start from the basics and take the students through the whole process. If I can just mention, there's another question I usually get. What can I do with this degree? What job and can I do afterwards? Well, firstly, it is a law degree. So, of course, you can work as an attorney, also, also as an advocate. Um, one very nice thing that we have in this um, module is we've got people who's in practice who's teaching it. So it's very interesting if you do the court case and it's, a, and it's a constitutional court case, then the person presenting your class will be one of the parties who appeared in the constitutional court, one of the, the advocates. So uh, um, firstly, it's very good for a legal background, for a, a, a degree. Then also in commerce, um, if you want to go into business, it can help you. Um, we also have a lot of students from state departments um, taking this degree. Uh, Dr. Klaassen, I, as I listen to you, I've, you've mentioned a, uh, a few of the different assessments, uh, as, especially the different forms the assessment uh, takes on. You've mentioned uh, take, a, take home, take away uh, uh, assignments, multiple choice, uh, sit down examinations and so on. Uh, I'd like to, to to expand a little bit more on this because 
we are we are in a situation where the mode of delivery is very fluent at this stage. We don't know with the COVID regulations and if we're going to continue with the online thing uh, next year. Uh, please expand a little bit more on on mode of delivery, but specifically then also the different kinds of assessments that you have within this qualification. Well, uh, I think I mentioned the mode of delivery is not fixed yet for next year, but we will keep students up to date on how uh, we will deliver the, the different subjects. Um, usually it is contact, so we ask students to, to come into the university and to attend to the classes. Um, the assessments may vary. Um, we give lecturers each year some leeway on, on how they want to assess the students, but it will be communicated at the beginning of the year to all pr prospective students on how it will be done. Um, we hope that by next year uh, we can do full contact classes and if necessary full assessments, but we are geared for, for online teaching and online assessment. Thank you, Dr. Klaas, and it feels as if we'll always have Zoom with us uh, in, into the future. But thank you for the clarification, and, and let's see what the, the future holds. The best is to perhaps uh, contact us at the beginning of the year when you apply, uh, and we'll be able to forward you with the information that we have available uh, at that point in time. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Dr. Bram Klaassen on international trade. Next up, uh, we'll have Professor Michelle Barnard, and uh, we'll focus a little bit more on environmental law. Good morning, everyone joining in. It's really lovely to have this discussion and to have a chat about the content of two programs for which I am the program coordinator, also a lecturer in one of the modules that you might choose as an elective as part of your curriculum. So as you have seen on the slide beforehand, I am uh, Michelle Barnard. I am one of the lecturers in the program of environmental law and governance together with the MPhil program that runs together with this program. These are two distinct and separate programs. And I'm going to go into a bit more detail on how you're going to construct your curriculum, seeing as how the environmental law masters and MPhil masters differ quite a bit from the other masters programs that you might have listened to earlier this morning. So all the other masters programs that we do offer here at the law faculty of the Northwest University have set curricula, meaning that you have four modules that you have to take. There's no choice in the matter. But with our masters in environmental law and with the MPhil in environmental law and governance, you do have the option of compiling your own curriculum from a set of nine for the LLM in environmental uh, law and governance and 10 modules in the MPhil program. So looking first at a bit of history for the master's program here at the Northwest University, we were uh, the first university to have an environmental law master's being presented at a university. And luckily for us, we also have a very strong critical mass of um, knowledgeable experts on the fields that you might choose to study during your two year or minimum one year course in the environmental law masters. So the history, as I've said, uh, this uh, master's program is now almost 10 years old and we have the following modules that you will see on the screen once they come up, which we present over the course of two semesters. When you're choosing your modules, you may choose to um, move or space your modules over the course of two years, in actual case over the course of four semesters. So you may choose to take only two modules in the first year, one module in the first year and then three in the second year. You may choose to take all of your modules in one semester and have them done and then focus only on your research component, which will be your dissertation. So on the screen now, we can see that we are referring to um, a couple of first semester modules. You will see that I have South African environmental law and international and regional environmental law on the screen, LLM 0811 and LLM E811. 
Now, these two modules are compulsory modules, which means that you have to take either one of these modules when compiling your curriculum. You are then, or you do then have the option of taking the other module as well in conjunction with two other electives. So it is possible for you to have both South African environmental law and international and regional environmental law coupled with two other electives. Most students choose to take South African environmental law, seeing that some or most of our students are practicing attorneys or are governmental officials. So it's to their benefit to have a greater or intensive knowledge on South African environmental law rather than international and regional environmental law, which has a much more theoretical component to it. Looking at the other modules that we present uh, together with international and South African environmental law on the screen, you can see occupational health and safety law as well as climate change and energy law. Climate change and energy law being the module that I'm responsible for in teaching. On the screen, we do now have two of the modules which will not be presented in 2021. With the number of modules that we have in this program being nine that you can possibly choose from, we do make, take turns in presenting certain modules and you will receive information on this a year beforehand to make sure that you can structure your curriculum in the way you would like to have it. So for 2021, the modules of occupational health and safety law will not run and climate change and energy law will not run. These modules will run again in 2022. On the screen now, you see the rest of the modules are being listed. We have natural resources law, South African planning law, administrative law, uh, local government and environmental law, and then also mining law. So as you can see, a really wide variety of modules that you can choose from to tailor make the curriculum that most suits your needs and what you would like to take out of the master's program that you have followed. Looking at assessments and also the method of instruction or contact sessions, next year hopefully we will be back to the full on contact mode of delivery where we follow a quite a different path than the other programs, the other master's programs. If you have listened in earlier, you will have learned that they have their contact sessions over weekends. Uh, space throughout the semester. It's a bit uh, different for the environmental law masters, specifically the masters. This is not for the MPhil. I will speak about this just now. So specifically for the environmental law masters program for which you do need an undergraduate law qualification to qualify for this program. We have two mini block weeks throughout each semester. This runs from a Thursday up to a Saturday and you are attending contact sessions or classes with the owners or lecturers of the modules for six hours at a time. So spaced over these three days, you will have the three modules or four modules running in the first semester, three or four modules running in the second semester. And depending on how you have structured your curriculum, you will then have your contact sessions over a Thursday to a Saturday period two of these block weeks per semester. And as I've said, this is only for the environmental law masters. So contact sessions having been dealt with, looking at assessments. This differs to a large extent between lecturers and between modules, where in certain modules with your assignments, you will receive this at the beginning of the semester, and this will take the form of an essay type question that you are expected to research and to submit on Yafundi, the electronic platform that we use. These assignment or essay questions or answers are also put through Turnitin in order to make sure that no plagiarism has taken place. So when you are doing all of your research, make sure that this is always original work that you are submitting. Looking at exams, also different between the different modules where we see that most of the modules presented have takeaway exam papers. So a question paper open for you on Ifundi, you download it, you have three to four days to do research and answer this question and then submit your answer on Ifundi again. Other modules a bit uh, different. Mine, for instance, I have a sit down four hour question paper where you have a hundred mark question paper that you have to complete in the time space of four hours, submit it again on your fundi and run it through, turn it in. 
to compile your module marks to see whether you've passed or not, you have to obtain a minimum of 50% for the assignment, one assignment per module. So 50% for the assignment and then 50% minimum for your exam paper. So between the two, an average of 50%, otherwise you do not pass the module. If you do not pass the module, you have the option to retake the same module or to register for another module in the second semester to make up the credits that you have lost out on for not passing that specific module. This is the content of the assessment plan and the contact, contact session for the Masters in Environmental Law. Going over to the M4 qualification, this is a qualification that's open for candidates who do not have an undergraduate law qualification. So if you have not completed a BUDIS or an LLB, um, even a BA law degree, if you have not completed any one of these degrees, you do have the option of following our M full program. So what makes the M full program different from the Masters in Environmental Law and Governance is that there's less strict focus on the legal component of environmental law. So when you look at the modules that I have highlighted to you earlier in the session, your electives remain exactly the same, but with the difference that because we share the MPhil program with the um, Faculty of Environmental Sciences, they also have a module that they present in the MPhil program. And this is a compulsory module. You have no choice in taking this. So the moment that you register for the MPhil program, you do know that you will have automatically been registered for environmental management, which is presented by Professor Francois Retief, who is associated not with the Faculty of Law, but with the Faculty of Environmental Sciences. The rest of your three electives are compiled by choosing all of the electives that I have already listed for you with the environmental law program. Another difference, you are not obliged to take either South African or international environmental law. Any three of the electives may be taken in conjunction with environmental management in order for you to compile your own curriculum. And now with the contact sessions for the MPhil program, different from the Environmental Law Masters, the Environmental Law Masters is strictly administrated by the Faculty of Law, while the MPhil program is strictly administrated by the Faculty of Environmental Sciences. They do not follow the same route as us with the two mini uh, contact weeks or block weeks throughout the semester. So with environmental management specifically, you will be obliged to participate in and uh, yes, to attend a contact session at the beginning of the first semester, which will run for an entire week. And then again, a block week, Monday to Friday, to attend that in the second semester. You will receive communication from the um, Faculty of Environmental Sciences on when the dates of these block weeks will be and you will receive information from the Faculty of Law on when the block weeks for your electives in the environmental law and governance programs will be. Looking at your requirements for admission, different as I've stated already for the Masters in Environmental Law and Governance you have to have an undergraduate law degree of some sort. This is not a requirement for the M full degree, but seeing as how you're going to have three of your electives focusing very strongly on legal aspects and legal issues. We do have a list of four modules that are listed in the yearbook that is available on the website and on the Facebook page of the faculty. In the yearbook, we have four modules listed that you have to have successfully completed in order for you to gain access to the MPhil program. If you're interested in this program, please do consult the yearbook on the modules that you have to complete. And the method we usually use in this is to have students participate in the modules with UNISA. So taking the modules at UNISA and at the end of that year, the four modules have been passed and you then have access to the MPhil program. The assessments in the MPhil program with the um, management side of it or with the module on environmental management, the same as with your electives in your master's structured master's program. 
you will receive one assignment to complete again in the essay type form you will submit this on your fundi it will be put through turn it in in order to ascertain plagiarism you will write an exam paper which could take the form of a sit down paper which could take the form of a takeaway paper and again the same as with the masters in environmental law and governance we will expect of you to obtain a minimum of 50 degrees in your module um, at the end at average of 50% with 50% minimum in your assignment and 50% minimum in your exam paper. And that in short, ladies and gentlemen, is the content of our MPhil in environmental law and governance and our master's program in environmental law and governance. Professor Barnard, uh, you've given us uh, a lot to, uh, to think about and to talk about. I've made a few notes here. It's, a, it's an incredible field and, and often you hear people talk about expertise available, but you, you've mentioned now we've, we've been into the study of environmental law on a postgraduate level for 10 years at the Northwest University. So over a, a period of 10 years, you do get the experts on board and expert supervision as well. Absolutely. Just to make mention of some of the colleagues that we have with us in the master's program, um, she's very warm-heartedly referred to and lovingly referred to as the grandmother of environmental law in South Africa and Professor Wilhelmine Duplessis will forgive me in referring to her as such. Um, she is the driving force behind the creation of the Masters in Environmental Law and still in running South African Environmental Law, for which she is the responsible lecturer. We have a research professor, Professor Louis Kotze. Um, he has a research repertoire longer, not even than my arm, longer than my legs put together. <laughs> he's an exceptional researcher and he's responsible, together with Dr. Neil Libber, for international and regional environmental law. On that point with the regional environmental law, specific focus on African environmental law. So looking at, at the African Union and what's going on there in terms of environmental protection and environmental rights. And then also at SADC, the Southern African Development Community. So no focus on the European Union, only a focus on African regional law. We have Professor Anel Duplessis, who you just uh, saw speaking this morning on the chair. So she's the holder of the chair, and she's also the lecturer responsible for local government and environmental law. She's an absolute expert on the matter, and all of these names that I have just listed to you, we also have practicing attorneys. Uh, Professor Shusan Bouillon, who also has an extraordinary position here at the Northwest University, is responsible for South African planning law, and she works with this on a daily basis, litigates on planning and environmental law on a daily basis. Another outside, if I can call it that, lecturer who's not um, directly affiliated with the faculty itself is Professor Piet Meiberg, who's, an, who's actually a labor law expert and he's responsible for occupational health and safety and how environmental law and occupational health and safety goes together. So we have, from the start, have a very strong focus point on research in environmental law and everyone on their specific field of expertise attend uh, annual conferences, annual seminars, continuously publish and research on the topics that they are directly involved with. And also throughout the 10 years, we have seen new fields of environmental law coming into the program. For instance, climate change and energy law, for which I'm responsible, is a relatively new module in the program. It's only been running for, for five years, for half of the lifetime of the, the structured masters but also a very relevant module and I must say a very, very popular one as well. And I think it is because we see a lot of um, social media attention being paid to the issue, especially of climate change in South Africa. Now we've all felt the effects of the rolling blackouts that have started running again, um, so-called load shedding. So looking at the content of and the interrelationship between how we generate and consume energy and electricity for that matter, and our contribution as a South African um, society to the global issue of climate change. Professor Barnard, I think we can talk for days on this. It's fascinating. And I mean, climate change law, yeah. what an exciting new uh, field uh, to, to find yourself in. Uh, and all available at the NWU. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, expert in environmental law, one of the experts, Professor Michelle Barnard.
Professor Barna, thank you so much. Next up, uh, we'll focus on criminal law and we'll have Professor Peter de Toy. Ladies and gentlemen, before we get to uh, Prof. Peter, uh, just one of the questions I'd like to address quickly. The question was, if you are in practice and want a more in-depth knowledge of mercantile law, would you recommend the degree? And we asked Dr. Killian, and he confirmed that the LLB degree is sufficient. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we also get a few questions here on mode of delivery and distance and a uh, way to attend compulsory classes. You hear that uh, each of the different degrees have uh, different modes of delivery, uh, predominantly uh, uh, a mix between uh, contact and distance. The best thing would be to contact us with your questions about the specific degree once you uh, apply and, and uh, notify us of your intention to study. And then uh, we'll read the situation and uh, see where we are in terms of the current regulations as to how we can get together and uh, how that togetherness uh, should look within an educational environment. Right, criminal law and procedure. I think that's our focus for now. And welcome to Professor Peter de Toy. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. The professional criminal professional degree in criminal law and procedure is certainly one of the first of its kind in the country as far as I know and also at the Northwest University. Now broadly it has the same structure as all other LLM structured LLM programs apart from the issue of um, the research component. So the main difference there is basically that less credits are accorded to research in the, in the professional uh, degree. In most um, programs, 100, 100 um, credits are accorded. In this one, only 45. And it does not have to be in the form of a mini dissertation. It can be uh, in the form of heads of argument and a series of assignments that we give you. And that also makes it quite possible to complete the degree within a year's time. Now, there are five modules in the program, uh, namely criminal law. It's presented in the first semester. And criminal procedure is also uh, presented in the first semester. Uh, combating corruption and the law of evidence are both presented in the second semester. And the research module is a year module. Now, some aspects that we deal with, for instance, in criminal law, we deal with hate speech, racketeering, and corporate crime, and the sentencing of corporations. In criminal procedure, we deal with um, appeals, search and seizure, asset forfeiture. Uh, in combating corruption, we deal with corruption in procurement. And in evidence, we deal with things like forensic evidence, uh, digital evidence, and so forth. Um, now, some of our presenters include Dr. Jo Marie Fisser from the University of the Free State. She was a former prosecutor, but also a forensic scientist at the South African Police Services. So she will make the presentation on DNA evidence, for instance probably South Africa's most well-known former prosecutor, advocate Harry Nell, also presents in the program in criminal procedure. He currently heads the private prosecutions unit of AFRI Forum. Dr. Dwayne Aslett from Forensic Sciences, uh, he presents on um, corruption. He's also involved in research for the, for the Zondo Commission. Then we also have um, Advocate Jeanette Neffeling. She's the Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions of the Northwest and also the head of the Specialized Commercial Crimes Unit in the province. All the academics also have considerable experience as prosecutors or state advocates. Now, there are four to five seminar session sessions each uh, semester. Uh, 
they are compulsory and they are mostly on Fridays and Saturdays. All assessments are in the form of takeaway open book exams or assessments. Um, and we really try to present a con contemporary program to students um, to empower them uh, with modern day issues in criminal law and procedure. Uh, Professor Latoy, uh, you've, you've, you mentioned that this, it's possible to complete this qualification within a year. That, that research module that's usually a year, it can perhaps uh, uh, run concurrently with the other modules, am I right? Yes, it's basically a year module. So typically what you will have, like all other modules, you will have two um, research assignments that make up a participation mark, and then you will have a, a final research assignment, usually in some form of practice-based um, form, for instance, heads of argument, writing a judgment, something like that. I'm, I'm also amazed about the degree to which you pull in experts uh, from the field. I mean, these uh, uh, forensic experts, for instance, uh, people with a lot of experience in, in prosecution, etc. cetera. Um, how does that balance work between the experts that you get in with the, with the uh, in-field expertise, if you'd like, and the, the more academic part that comes with it? I think we've, it, it makes it a very balanced degree. It is, um, I suppose, one could say a more practical degree. Um, but yeah, so we have practitioners, senior people in the NPA, and then we also have full-time academics with a strong background in practice as well. Uh, just to confirm, on, on uh, the, the options for the mini dissertation, uh, you mentioned uh, 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 arguments, or what, what was it that you mentioned that it, you could replace it with? It's of argument. So it's typically a court-based document where you prepare your argument in written form according to the rules of the court. So typically, how many of these would substitute the mini dissertation? Or is it just one or one comprehensive one? It, it's usually the, the final one is one comprehensive one, but you will have smaller ones in the course of the program. Fascinating. Uh, Professor, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this is, as you would say, as you said, uh, a very, very strong balance between uh, the practical and the academic. Uh, I find it fascinating that people can specialize, especially within this forensic field, is it not? Yeah, well, it, it includes forensics, but it's a bit wider. Yeah. But of all, thank you so much, uh, Professor. Uh, really appreciate your presence here, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Peter de Toy on uh, criminal law. Uh, if you are interested in this field, this will be the man uh, to deal with. Thank you so much. Next up, we'll uh, move on a little bit to uh, child law, and we'll have uh, 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 Chantel Feldhaus uh, to talk a little bit uh, uh, about that. Right, ladies and gentlemen, a uh, kind reminder that we uh, uh, can deal with your questions. Uh, just pose your questions in the comments uh, section and we'll try to address it live. If not, we'll follow up a little bit later. You've also heard a few of the academics refer to yearbooks. Uh, now, these yearbooks are available uh, on the uh, website of the Northwest University. If you go to study at, you'll see there is a section where all the yearbooks uh, are available. Uh, the Faculty of Law, the website we have on the uh, uh, university's website is also very comprehensive. You're more than welcome to take a gander at that uh, website. And also, before we start, just uh, another reminder, at the end of this webinar, we'll have five lucky draws for those of you who have participated and attended. We look forward to that, right, but we also look forward to our next uh, expert. We have Chantelle Feldhaus uh, to talk a little bit about child law. Chantelle, we are in your hands. Um, thank you so much. Uh, good morning. Um, yes, uh, the Child Law International Child Law Masters is one of the smaller masters. We usually only have around five to ten students, which makes it very uh, 
we can give all uh, all of them all the the time that we have um, there's four compulsory subjects uh, which is international child and family law uh, international children's human rights uh, the second semester is international social justice and international juvenile justice now as you can hear it is all the subjects is international that doesn't mean it's an international qualified qualification it just means we look at it from international law perspective um, we also have the research methodology uh, and a mini dissertation uh, to give you an idea what what we usually do in the dissertations is uh, we look at child labor uh, child marriages uh, we also refer to something like Ukutwala, which is when children are removed without the permission of, of the parents. Um, we also look at surrogacy agreements, inter-country adoption. Uh, to give you an idea from a practic practical point of view is, for example, Madonna um, <laughs> and, and Angelina Jolie. <laughs> so uh, we, work, we work on... in inter-country adoption, child soldiers, um, so anything that has to do with children, basically. Mm -hmm. Our mode of delivery is contact. Um, uh, we have a takeaway for exams. In other words, uh, you get your assignment or your exam paper, and you get either 24 or 36 hours to make, uh, to do your research and submit your paper. So it's not a sit down. Uh, I think one of the questions they usually ask is what is the career opportunities? Now, because it's so specialized, uh, one would think uh, if we look at international juvenile justice, for example, South Africa's, got a, South Africa's got a different system when it comes to children and the legal aid South Africa uh, will give representation to all those children. So there's a lot of opportunities uh, to specialize in because every child's got a right to legal representation. Uh, so usually at all NGOs, UNICEF, for example, the UN, uh, I know of, of persons that, that got work at the UN. Um, so there's various types of, of um, career opportunities mm -hmm. because it's so specialized, yeah. Mm -hmm. Chantal, we, uh, uh, we've had uh, uh, a question here that also relates to the uh, you know, the, the relevance, the, the worth of the qualification, uh, specifically so. Uh, the, the work that you do, is it uh, within this field? Would it be of academic nature? What would be the impact of, of the work that you do? You've mentioned now and you've answered it uh, partially by saying that uh, uh, you avail yourself, uh, services, uh, you, the representation of the child, etc. Um, uh, but further than that, uh, the integration of what we see studied here into legislation, uh, uh, what, what would you uh, comment on when, when commenting on the impact of, of this qualification? Um, what we've seen the, the past few years is, is family law and specifically child law has become quite important. Uh, because this is international, we look at, for example, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, we do regional work within the African Charter. Um, so you can either be very academic regarding it, but as I said, this is a very social type of, of, of qualification. So you will probably end up uh, with an NGO because you have to have um, a certain mindset regarding, uh, because you work with children. Um, so, but like I said, because of the, the Child Justice Act, which came into operation 2010, um, gives every child that, that's in a criminal system needs to have a lawyer mm. or a legal representation. So it opened up a lot of career opportunities mm. to specialize because we don't do child law uh, in the LLB. We only touch on it. Mm. And this is very specialized. So mm. most LLB curriculums I know of don't have child law as a subject. It's a, it's a very tricky field because there's a balance between the anthropological or the cultural, yes. uh, the, the sociological, the, the, the norms that you would find 
within a society that often would clash. Uh, I mean, child marriages would be one example. Mm. It's such a tricky field. How do you navigate it? How do you move into this and, and find the balance between what would be societal and what would be legislative or from a law perspective? Yes, the, the, the most issues we have is social issues. Um, like I said, child labor. Um, I see here now one million children are incarcerated. Yeah. Um, and, and, and international law states it should be the, the last option is to incarcerate a child mm -hmm. for petty theft, for example. One million, UNICEF estimates one million. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of social issues. Um, and the, the, the thing with this is, is to, to know the law when you work with children um, to help them because they can't help themselves. Mm -hmm. And, and again, we see the balance here between the international and the national as well. When, when studying in this field, you can't just have knowledge of the national. Uh, there is a very strong international focus yes. as well. Uh, our constitution actually states that we have to take international law into consideration. Um, we have section 28 in the constitution, which is based on the international norms. And because we have international obligations, we now have the Children's Act and the Child Justice Act because of international norms or the obligation. Right. Now, back to a mode of delivery. It sounds as if there's a great flexibility in the mode of delivery. And uh, often when we deal with uh, uh, large classes, it's just easier for an online session. We've, we've had mm. so much uh, uh, knowledge within that field of late. Uh, but uh, you've also mentioned that you, you, you don't have a large intake. So there's a, a strong degree of, of individual attention that you give to your students. Could yes. you expand a little bit more on, on that? Yes, because I said it, it's, it's a very specialized field. Now, uh, regarding the mode of delivery, it, it depends largely. I mean, we've done it this year. Um, it's very flexible because you don't have so much, so many students. For example, one of the lecturers uh, we fly in from Stellenbosch, Dr. Deborah Austin, um, and usually she will say, "Can I have two to three days?" And then we, we discuss it um, and see. Uh, I mean, we, one would like to to plan, um, but I mean it's flexible because because we're a small group. Um, and yeah, we will probably see next year what, what the mode is. So, so we're flexible regarding mm -hmm. that. That's wonderful because uh, uh, that individual attention is, uh, I mean, just, just focusing on the different questions that you can ask within this very broad field, mm -hmm. within this specific field, if, I, if I, I'm contrasting myself, but you understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, there are so many options for you to focus on. Um, so I think in the course of your study, you have lots of different questions and then accessibility of supervisors or mm, experts mm. uh, become so crucial uh, for you to in order in order for you to develop your own expertise yes yes uh, 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 what uh, lecturers we have in the program uh, it's myself which which does international juvenile justice with advocate quran former prosecutor then we have dr horston um, from stellenbosch um, and then Professor Hein Libber and Dr. Alison Gedult. So there's a lot of capacity regarding, and you always there will be a topic with a child involved. You can actually take any any top legal topic and just um, ask the question regarding uh, the obligations for, on, on children mm. and the responsibility on children. Incredible, uh, Chantal Feldhaus. Thank you so much uh, for coming in and sharing with us uh, this incredible field. Uh, really, it's, uh, it's fascinating and uh, good luck with the work that you do. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's both a formal but also a heartfelt uh, yes. uh, thing. It's a very important field. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right, uh, we've had uh, Chantelle Feldhaus. Now, next on, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be moving on to Labour Law and Dr. Esti Gressa. Right, ladies and gentlemen, at the very start of the webinar, we've had a talk on the postgraduate diploma in labor law, but now we're looking 
at masters and uh, doctoral. Uh, Labor law, our expert here, and who will introduce us into uh, this field, is Dr. Esti Gresser. Good morning. Goeiemorgen. Doe my lang. Savabona. Are you a final year student with an interest in labor law? Or are you perhaps already a practicing attorney who wishes to acquire more detailed knowledge about the South African labor law? The LLM program in labor law at Northwest University enables students to obtain current and relevant knowledge on the South African labor law and equips students with tools to solve complex labor law issues in practice. This program is ideal for those who are already practicing in labor law and wishes to stay up to date or for those who are only starting their law careers and aspires to be labor law experts. We aim to offer a highly professional and comprehensive program covering the most important aspects of labor law. I compiled a list of frequently asked questions based on correspondence I receive from time to time. Firstly, how many modules are included in this program? You will have five modules in total. In the first semester, we offer individual labor law and collective labor law. Individual labor law is presented by Dr. Boetes, a senior lecturer in our faculty. In this module, many themes related to individual labor law are dealt with, such as unfair dismissal, unfair labor practices, employment equity, and many others. The other first semester module is collective labor law, also offered by one of the senior lecturers in the faculty, Mr. Nukumise. In this module, topics such as freedom of association, and organizational rights are unpacked. In the second semester, we offer two more modules, being public international and comparative labor law and social security and occupational health and safety law. The first module I mentioned is offered by one of the research professors in our faculty, Prof. Chitamira. Many interesting topics will be discussed in both of these modules such as the influence of international best practices on the South African labor law, and then also regional aspects of social security and labor law. The other second semester module is offered by one of our extraordinary professors, Professor Marius Willefer. It must also be noted that it will be required of all students to submit a research proposal followed by a mini dissertation. Students will also have to attend research methodology workshops, and also work in close collaboration with their study supervisor. Then secondly, one of the most frequent questions I receive relates to on the days lectures are presented, also on which campus this program is offered. This program is currently offered on two of our campuses, the Pochestrum and the Maiken campus. There will be more or less four contact sessions per module, which is usually scheduled on a Saturday. One of the lectures for the year will, however, fall on a Friday and a Saturday. This year, due to the COVID pandemic, all of our lectures were successfully presented using various virtual platforms. Then another question I frequently receive relates to the assessment of the LLA modules. In other words, what is the method for evaluation for the different modules? Is it exam based? Is it open book or is it closed book? There will be two assignments per module during the course of each semester. From that, the participation will be calculated. The average of the two assignments provided that both assignments were passed with a minimum of 50% will be used to calculate the participation. Naturally, a student therefore needs at least a minimum of 50% to also gain access to the examination of a particular module. Final exams are also written for all of the different modules in both semesters. The nature of the exam largely depends on each lecturer, but for the labor law program, uh, it is primarily a sit down examination and it must be completed within four hours. The exam also has to be passed with a minimum of at least 50%. The average of the participation 
and the exam mark then forms the final module mark, which also has to be a minimum of at least 50%. Then another question I frequently receive is, uh, is the seminar program the same for our part-time and our full-time students? Yes, we do not draw a distinction. I have a, di a diploma. Will I qualify to be admitted for an LLM? Unfortunately, you need an LLB or another equivalent four-year legal uh, qualification, which allows you access to the legal profession. What is the closing date for applications? Applications will close by 31 October. Then, I do not see dispute resolution as a possible module, as is the case with Nelson Mandela University. Could this be an option for Northwest University in 2021? Dispute resolution is a subtopic covered in the module Collective Labor Law in the first semester. To conclude, Labor Law plays an instrumental role in the reduction of inequality and poverty. Further, the fourth industrial revolution calls for the constant amendment of labor laws. The world of work as we know it is constantly changing and the fourth industrial revolution, revolution will have both positive and negative impacts on the world of work as we know it. As future labor practitioners, you will need to have a sound understanding of all the relevant national, regional, as well as international policies and legislation. And our master program exists to bridge this gap and to equip students with the necessary knowledge and skills to adapt to this changing environment. I look forward to meet you in 2021. Dr. Kresa, thank you so much. Uh, and, and for all those typical questions that you've answered now, uh, some of them uh, we've seen here um, and some of them you've answered uh, already. Thank you so much. There is one question still. We've answered it partially when we spoke about the uh, postgraduate diploma, and it's a question about working uh, at the CCMA. The question is specifically, does one need an LLM in labor law to work at the CCMA? Now, in, in, the, in the diploma, we've had the answer that after completion of the diploma, uh, you will work in a mentorship program for uh, uh, a few months still but that was the diploma now we're talking about uh, the masters uh, what's your answer to the question thank you for the question um yes definitely and that is only merely one of the options that you will have once you qualify with an LLM so uh, you, working at the CCMA you can perhaps uh, work as a commissioner you will have to undergo if I'm not mistaken six months uh, training still after you've completed your LLM at the CCMA but you can also of course act as a, a legal advisor for one of the parties or as a legal representative remember there's different uh, stages or processes followed at the CCMA so perhaps uh, you can help your client to prepare for a conciliation session or the, it can, there can be a con-op session at the CCMI where legal representation are allowed. So then you can either act as a legal uh, 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 practitioner or, of course, then at the, as the commission at the CCMI. Dr. Gresa, labor law is such a, uh, a broad field as well. Uh, I can imagine that many students knock on your door uh, with the idea, I want to study in labor law, but when it comes to choice of, of focus, uh, perhaps uh, uh, then they struggle. How, how do you go about in guiding them and helping them decide on a, a focal area within their research? Okay, so you're talking specifically about the, the research of the, yes. of the, in the program. Okay, yes, definitely. Um, the best of all the, the advice that I usually give students is to go read. Um, you open, I don't think our students read the newspaper in the traditional manner these days, but if they open their Facebook and the, the News 24 comes, comes up, the news feed, um, basically there's daily uh, news articles on possible strike action in the, in the government about a, a failure of a rise or a picketing happening at some company or a company who committed an unfair labor practice. So I always give advice to the students is to go read. And once you've done the reading and you've done your, your, your research, it will assist you then to identify uh, the gap, as, as we can call it, and then uh, to identify a research problem. So it 
starts with reading. I always tell even my undergraduate students, you have to, if you want to practice law, you have to have a, a love to read. <laughs> and you, you really have to, to read a lot in order to identify a possible research problem. Dr. E.C. Gresa, thank you so much uh, for coming in and talking to us about labor law. We appreciate your, your presence here. Uh, just before we introduce our next uh, speaker, uh, the question was, uh, does the topic picked for the mini dissertation for LLB influence which LLM one is able to do? And the answer is yes uh, or, or no. The answer is, it is recommended to continue with the same topic uh, for your LLM. So yes, the topic you have on the LLB does influence what you do with the LLM. Thank you so much. Next up, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, the Deputy Director pro, uh, for the Postgraduate Programme, Professor Henk Klopers, who will talk to us about estate law. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are back with uh, our last speaker for the day, Professor Henk Klopers, and he'll address us on estate law. Thank you so much for the introduction, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the presentation on the LLM in estate law. And I'm going to explain the LLM in estate law by using a short introduction or a short example so I know that due to the COVID pandemic, many of you might have spent a bit more time at home, um, possibly a lot more time behind your computers, and maybe sometimes not being as productive and sometimes playing online gaming. Now imagine you play an online game where you purchase um, online property for your avatar, for instance, your avatar requires a sword and you buy a sword using your credit card. So what you've done is you've used real money to purchase something in the virtual environment. Now from an estate planning point of view, the question that we are faced with is what do we do with that property when you die? Does that property actually become part of your estate? What happens if you sell your sword online will you be paying some form of taxes on that sort that you've sold? So basically what we're asking is, what is the extent of your estate? What is included in your estate? And how can we plan your estate? Is there something that we can do with your online sword to remove it from your personal estate? Can it be owned in a trust, for instance? So these are all issues that we will be dealing with in the LLM in estate planning, to bring that more into the virtual environment that we are. We know that traditionally you had a CD collection. The CDs was actual real property. Nowadays you have an iTunes account. The question is, what happens with that iTunes account the day when I die? Can I bequeath that? Does it have a value? So that is the type of interesting issues that we deal with in this particular LLM. So as with all our LLMs, or structured LLMs, this program consists of five modules, four structured modules, and a mini dissertation of approximately 60 pages. So the first, first module that, we are, that you will be taking is the module in financial planning law, LLMB 811, focuses primarily on personal financial planning. Here you will deal with issues regarding insurance, for instance. Coming back to our online example, if you have bought the online sword, can you insure that sword? So we will be dealing with theory regarding insurance. In this module, we will also be dealing with issues regarding retirement planning. What is required to draft a proper budget and what is the role of budgeting within financial planning? This is a first semester module that is presented by myself and Ms. Naima Gabru. The second module that you will have is also a first semester module, LLMB 812. This is a capita selector in private law and consists of three broad subject fields. 
The first one is the law of succession. In this section of the module, we will be dealing with issues such as the freedom of testation. Am I allowed to bequeath my online sort to whoever I would like to? Or will there be limitations on what I can do with that? The second broad theme deals with the matrimonial property regimes. Coming back to the sword, will that sword form part of our in community of property estate when I die? Or does it form part of a separate estate outside of the community of property? And the final topic that will be dealt with in this module relates to the law of property. And again, our example perfectly relates to this. Can we consider something like virtual property as a form of property? And if so, what are we allowed to do with that particular property? This module is presented by Professors Marita Carnelli and Professor Vian Erlang, supported by Dr. Anel Goldeneis, who will deal with the issue of the law of succession. The second or the third module that we will be dealing with, LLMB871, is one of our core modules. This module is the module on estate planning. Here we will answer the bigger questions of how do you plan your estate? What is the estate planning theory? And what instruments can we use when we plan our estates? These instruments include instruments such as trusts. To what extent can we use a trust as part of our estate planning? and other forms of entities such as companies and closed corporations, or even a mix of the three. How can you structure your estate in such a way that your estate remains as small as possible from an estate duty point? The final module is the LLM B872 module, which is the tax law module. This module focuses on a variety of taxes. These include personal income tax, donations tax, estate duty, and capital gains tax, to name just a few. In this particular module, we will be focusing on these forms of taxes and how they impact on estate planning. You will be faced with very practical experience and you will be required to actually plan a personal estate, to make recommendations from where the estate currently is and how to improve the estate in order to lessen these forms of taxes that we've already mentioned. And in this instance, these two modules, estate planning and estate law, speaks to each other. Because the question is, can you plan an estate without looking at the tax side? Or when you're doing planning, do you only focus on tax without looking at the various entities that are available? These two modules are year modules. In other words, you will be required to do assessments throughout the year and only write the exam at the end of the year, as opposed to the first two modules, which will be first semester modules. The reason for the structure is amongst others to give you time in the second semester to attend to your dissertation. You will be required to do a mini dis dissertation in any of the four modules that I've just explained. And in any topic within the broader field of these four modules. In other words, you are free to either choose a topic which for instance relates to the question of virtual property, or you can deal with issues relating to, for instance, the variation of trusts. All of these broader themes falls within the scope of this particular program. This indicates, ladies and gentlemen, that you have a wide option when it comes to selecting a topic for your mini dissertation. At this stage, I would encourage you to, as soon as you've settled on this particular master's program as your choice for next year, that you start engaging with the presenters within this particular program in order to settle on a topic and start working and researching your topic as soon as possible. I might just mention that the modules, the two-year modules, in other words, the module on tax law 
and the module in estate planning is also presented by Ms. Kabru in collaboration with Professor Yaupe Kutsia, who is a currently a practicing attorney in the Paris region and who has years of experience practically planning estates. So this gives you a broad overview of what we will be doing in every module and just how interesting estate law can be. I bet that you haven't thought about the whole issue regarding virtual property. We deal with traditional issues such as uh, fixed property, but we tend to forget that currently we sit with a whole lot of potential virtual properties which could also be included in your estate. So the estate planning is seen as a holistic estate planning that we do, where we include all the various subjects into the estate planning. I might just mention finally as well that it is recommended that you have some background in either insurance law and very importantly that you have a background in tax law as well, since tax law forms the basis of the majority of our financial planning. I have been asked, what can you go and do with this master's program and where will I be able to work when I have completed this particular master's? The answer is that the majority of the financial institutions, in other words, your banks and your insurance companies, all have divisions where financial planning is being done for their clients. These are also referred to in some instances as your fiduciary divisions. So the possibility for work at the financial institutions is definitely there. Also, you do find smaller private practices that focuses on financial planning and the drafting of wills. I might just mention that, for example, something like the drafting of a will is just the introduction to estate planning and proper estate planning requires much more than simply drafting the will. It requires the work behind the scenes where you do the actual calculations of which you will do quite a few in this modules because this is a very practical LLM. Yeah, I think that covers the majority of, of my presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, you will uh, study estate law uh, like nowhere else. It's, uh, uh, you heard the professor speak and, and the focal areas, very, very interesting and far, far wider reaching than one would expect. Uh, professor, we have a question here on the mode of delivery, if you can perhaps uh, provide a little bit more detail on that. Um, how is the uh, course presented? Thank you for the question, Geerpia. It is presented as a contact in mode of delivery. In other words, we will have contact sessions. However, we must put in the caveat, it depends on what the national circumstances will be at the time. Currently, the program is presented online through via various forms of online platforms. But if and when normality returns, we will return to physical contact sessions where the students will be in Pochestruum because this is a Pochestruum contact mode of delivery um, and students will be required since it is a compulsory requirement that students will have to attend classes in person unless the circumstances does not allow that. Thank you professor. Just uh, another question that's perhaps not related uh, to estate law specifically uh, but the, the, I think it refers to the progression of studies into the postgraduate. If you have an LLB and a postgraduate diploma in labor, will you qualify for the LLM in labor law? And as I have it, the LLB is always a requirement for admission into the LLM. That is indeed the case. So you require either an LLB or a similar four-year law degree, and it must be a similar four-year law, law degree, such as the BPROC, but a full law degree is a requirement for all our structured masters. Uh, we've had a, a, a comment here, Professor, that says estate law is actually more interesting than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is the purpose of the presentation and I hope to see everyone in there. Uh, it is a 
definitely a growing field, Gepi, and we, we've seen our numbers increase in this particular program over the last few years, especially given the whole fourth industrial revolution that's been referred to and the notion of going online and virtual property and everything related to that. Right, uh, uh, Professor, one last question. Uh, closing dates, uh, when should people start uh, with their applications? Uh, what, what are the, uh, the degree of urgency that they should now move into? I think the online re applications close at the end of October, so the 31st of October. So I would urge everyone to su submit their applications before then. However, should you at some stage later decide that you really still want to do a master's, we also always consider late applications as well. So the fact that you're late by a week or so will definitely not dis disqualify your application. I look at all the applications. Professor Hink Kloppers, uh, both thank you for uh, the estate law enlightenment that you brought, but also for your role as Deputy Director of the Postgraduate uh, Programme. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have that uh, uh, the five uh, lucky doors that we have to deal with now. Uh, what will you be winning? Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a mystery. Uh, what we have at the moment is a hamper from the Faculty of Law. Amongst others, this would include a leather cover, a notebook, a, a corporate pen, a, a nice, very beautiful, corporate, stylish, eight gig USB. And then we have a special surprise. And, and just to reassure you, it is not a picture of myself. We've uh, considered that and we've decided not to include that. So that will not be a part of it, uh, but there will be an extra uh, surprise included in that. So who actually won? Uh, let me read out the names. We have your email addresses, so we'll be in contact and we'll make, make sure that we get your uh, prize to your door. Congratulations uh, to the following five people. Uh, Ole Bukheng Manamela. Congratulations, Ole Bukheng. And also congratulations to Victor Wilkins. Uh, Victor Wilkins, uh, congratulations to you. The last three names, Tumelo Koho. Congratulations, uh, Tumelo. Uh, you, your prize is on its way. Uh, Maruping John Tipo. Congratulations to you, sir. And then last but not least, congratulations to Siandra Diedrichs. Siandra, congratulations to you as well. Those are the five names. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for, for tuning in and listening to us. We look forward to your applications. And as always, we are here to help. Contact us and uh, we'll provide you with an answer as soon as possible. Enjoy your day.